Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we are going through the book of John. Uh, we're in the middle of the what is called the Upper Room Discourse. And this Upper Room Discourse, this will culminate in John chapter 17, which is sometimes referred to as Jesus's high priestly prayer. So the disciples, they're starting to get worried and confused because Jesus is telling them that, hey, I'm going to go away and that the world is going to hate you and that persecution is coming. Now, uh, Jesus knows that this is about the last time that he's going to talk with his disciples. At 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon from this, he'll be hanging on a cross. So what is his main message to his disciples before his death and resurrection? His main message is this. Brothers, love one another. Jesus said to them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. But, but we have to remember that this isn't Jesus's only message. Too many people think that Christianity is, oh, just love one another, just be nice, don't be judging people, be accepting to everybody. No, the, the main message of Christianity, Jesus, the cross, is that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that that Savior is Jesus, and if Jesus died on a cross doesn't mean anything to you, you should be concerned because that means that you will spend all of eternity, forever and ever, separated from him. Um, I'm not trying to scare you, but do you want to know what the Bible says about everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life? It says that they will be thrown in the lake of fire where they where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It's right there at the end of Revelations. So right now, we're going to start John chapter 16. We're in the middle of what is known as the Upper Room Discourse. So let's get out our Bibles and let's follow along. John chapter 16, verse 1. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Now, the New King James Version, it translates that word stumble. King James says, be offended. NIV and ESV, they use the word fall away. These things I have spoken to you so that you should not fall away. And the New Living Translation says, abandon your faith. Jesus was worried about people walking away from him, from, from people abandoning their faith. Uh, and he did think about the parable of the sowers. We find it in Matthew chapter 13, where some seed fell by the wayside where it was trampled and some seed fell on rock where it sprang up quickly. But then in times of trouble or persecution, it quickly fell away. So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm, I'm speaking these things to you so, so that you won't fall away. You won't walk away. Verse two, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time that is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Now, a couple things here. First off, Jesus warned them, they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Now, being excommunicated, that was a big deal in this time. Do you remember the blind man's parents back in John chapter 9? They didn't even they didn't even want to say how their son was healed because they were so afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. Now, it, it, it is interesting, is it not, how, how some people need human company and other people are just fine by themselves. Joan of Arc, she had a good quote. She was a French military leader in the 1400s. She was actually executed at the age of 19. But she said this. She said, it is better to be alone with God for his friendship never fails. All right, so now notice Jesus says, they will put you out of the synagogue and the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. This was the apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul thought he was doing God's service by persecuting Christians. But then after the Apostle Paul was converted, he began to be persecuted. So the persecutor became the persecutee. They have it. But we see it today that there are many terrorists, people that think they're doing something in the name of God who aren't. Now, we've talked about persecution a couple times in the last couple weeks. But Jesus is telling us that persecution is something that we should expect. It should be coming. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. William Tyndale, you ever heard of him? He was the first one to translate the Bible into English. And he was actually, he actually was persecuted for trying to get the Bible into the English language. But do you know what he said about that persecution? He said, I never expected anything else. You see, we've been warned that it should be coming. Um, I'm going to read a verse. This is 1 Peter 4.12. i got to turn there real quick. 1 Peter 4.12 says this. Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you 
as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. So Peter says, don't think it's strange when you're about to face persecution. Expect it. It's coming. Uh, one of my favorite preachers that I listen to, he says this. He says, you know, Acts 1.8, Jesus says, you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Acts 8.1 says, and severe persecution came upon the church. The way he says it, if you try to fulfill Acts 8.1 to take the message of the gospel out into all the world, if you try to fulfill that, you will experience Acts 8.1, severe persecution coming on the church. But we need to remember this. Times of persecution have actually been good for the church. That's a time of explosion. Tertullian, he was one of the early church fathers. He said this. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, we got to think about this too. Why do people not like Christians? Do you ever think about this? This is what I, I truly think this is what it is. They see us with our Bibles and see that we have joy and peace and purpose and contentment and meaning in life. And you know what? It bothers them. I, I really think that's what it is. So let's keep going here. Verse three, Jesus still talking. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. I think what Jesus is saying here is that he, Jesus, when Jesus was with them, he was taking the brunt of the persecution. It wasn't going to the disciples. It was all going to Jesus. But now that Jesus isn't going to be there in bodily flesh, guess what? The disciples are now going to be receiving the brunt of that persecution. I, I really think that Jesus... What he's saying to his disciples is like people today when, when they're sending a child out into the world. The, the parents are like, we've been here to protect you and guide you all this time. Now you're going out on your own. Now it's up to you and we'll see if what we've been training you in pays off. So verse five, verse five, this is Jesus. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Do you think the disciples are really believing this when Jesus says, hey, it, it's to your advantage that I'm leaving. I'm sure they're thinking, no, just stay here with us, Jesus. We want it to keep going like it's going. Now, so what's Jesus talking about now? Well, Jesus is now talking about the Holy Spirit. But why would that be an advantage for Jesus to go away so that the, the helper, the Holy Spirit can come? Well, if we think about this, Jesus was God in the flesh. He is fully God, but he was also fully man. So Jesus could only be in one place at one time due to physical limitations. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he can be everywhere at all times. And notice another thing. What did Jesus say here? If I depart, I will send him to you. Notice he says, I will send him to you. That's another way to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. It's only something God can do. You and I, we can't send the Holy Spirit out somewhere. But Jesus, what did he say? I will send him to you. Another time in John 14, I believe, Jesus says the Father will send him to you. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Trinity, the de deity of Jesus Christ, it, it's all throughout Scripture here. Verse 8, and when he has come, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. I'm going to stop right there. There really is only one sin that, that condemns a man. And what is that sin? That's the sin of unbelief. No matter what we've done, no matter what's in our past, the blood of Jesus covers it. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But, but if we ignore Jesus and what he did on the cross, we will receive the air of our way. So that, that is when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of sin because they do not believe in me. The sin of unbelief, that, that is the unpardonable sin in the Bible. So, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judge. Now, I want to talk about the righteousness that Jesus talks about here too. We have to be careful about putting our own standards of righteousness on others because that that can lead to 
self-righteousness and shallow legalism. Charles Spurgeon, he's called the Prince of Pe Preachers. But do you know that he smoked a cigar? And people actually called him out for smoking a cigar. Now, he also did only live to age of 57. Could have had something to do with it. But D.L. Moody once called Charles Spurgeon out for smoking a cigar. And he said, how can you do that and call yourself a Christian? And do you know what Charles Spurgeon did to D.L. Moody? Pointed at his belly and said, how can you have that and call yourself a Christian? So the prophet Isaiah, what does he say about our righteousness? It, it's all as filthy rags. Too many times I think we think that God grades on a curve. And as long as we're some better than somebody else, no. God's standards are perfection and, and we all fall short. Now we are supposed to perfect holiness in the fear of God, the Bible tells us. But but we're still going to fall short of, of God's perfect standards. We have to remember, God doesn't grade on a curve. One other thing I want to talk about here, since Jesus is talking about sending the Holy Spirit out in the world, how do we know that we have the Holy Spirit in us? Because our body is the temple of God. The Holy Spirit does live in us. How do we know that we have the Holy Spirit living in us? Well, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Ephesians 1.13 says, having believed, you received the Spirit of promise. Romans 8 9 also says, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. He's, he is not saved. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. Let's keep going. Verse 12, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I, I think Jesus thinks he's overloading his disciples. I'm telling you, you can't handle all this. Verse 13, however, when he... The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. It, it's kind of interesting. We actually get two outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Um, the first one is right after Jesus has been resurrected and he comes to his disciples and they've locked themselves in the upper room. And Jesus comes and says, peace to you. And then it says he breathes on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We find that in John chapter 20, verse 22. That's the first time, but it doesn't seem like they received the power of the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost on Acts chapter in Acts chapter 2, because Jesus said to his disciples, remain here until you have received the Spirit of promise. So Jesus says, I'm going to send out the Holy Spirit. We find that in Acts chapter 2. Verse 14, Jesus is still talking about the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Isaiah 42, 8, God says this. He says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. This is just, God says, my glory I will not give to another. What does Jesus says? He He's going to glorify me. Just another way we can say that, yes, Jesus is God. Verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. Um, at the end of the book of Matthew, at the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Now, what does he say? He says, all things that the Father has are mine. This is the same as when Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Verse 16, this is still Jesus talking. A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Now, these things are so much easier for us to understand because, because we're getting to read them in retrospect. We, we know what happens. The disciples at the time, they weren't understanding this, and we're going to see this right here. Verse 17, then some of his disciples said amongst themselves, what is this? He says to us, a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I go to my Father. They said, therefore, what is this he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Now, first off, notice that they're saying this amongst themselves in verse 17. Then some of his disciples said amongst themselves. If they have questions, Jesus is right there. Why didn't they just ask him? That's that's what I would think would make sense. But notice that they says, we don't understand what this guy is saying. Can I tell you, I'm glad that the disciples said this right here. Um, and there was another time, it was back in John chapter 6, Jesus was saying all these things, and it's John chapter 6, verse 60, where his disciples go, these are hard sayings, who can understand them? And then right here, they, they say, we don't know what this guy's saying. These guys were Jesus' closest companions, they walked side by side with Jesus for three years, and guess what? Even they didn't understand everything. 
So why am I saying this? I think the takeaway of this, we, we don't have to have all the answers. There are hard questions in Christianity. Now, some people can go and take questions on a college campus and just answer them like that. But you and I, we're probably not that smart. We don't have to know everything. What do we just have to know? As the Apostle Paul said, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I determined not to know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. All right, we're going to leave off right there in verse 18. That's about the middle of the chapter here. We'll finish John chapter 16 next week. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.